Welcome to the Catholic Sobriety Podcast, the go-to resource for women seeking to have a deeper understanding of the role alcohol plays in their lives, women who are looking to drink less or not at all for any reason. I am your host, Christy Walker. I'm a wife, mom, and a joy-filled Catholic, and I am the Catholic Sobriety Coach, and I am so glad you're here. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me once again. I have a wonderful guest today. Her name is Belinda Taro Mooney. And Belinda is a mom, a widow, a secular Carmelite, and the author of a few books. One of them is Christ the King, Lord of History, The Continuing Story with Anne Carroll. Another is My Therapeutic Lifestyle Changes Workbook, creating a comprehensive plan for a calm, ordered life Catholic edition. And she is currently working on another book with the working title of Praying with the Saints on Their Feast Days. Belinda is licensed in social work and addictions, and she teaches at Long Star College. You can find out more about Belinda, her books, and her work at tlcwellnessinstitute.com. Thank you so much for being here, Belinda. Hi. Good to be here, Christy. So before we get into some of the questions that I have for you, would you mind sharing a little bit of how you got interested in the work um, that you do in the field of addiction recovery and, you know, teaching others to do the same? Right. Well, it goes all the way back to my graduation from School of Social Work. At the time, I needed to get a job uh, so that my uh, then husband, I'm a widow now, but so that he could go back to school. So I took the first job, which was at an adolescent prison for young men who were 15 to 21 years old. And the second day on the job, my supervisor looked at me and she said, Miss Mooney, I want you to do a substance abuse program. So I was already a social worker with a caseload and now I was gonna do a substance abuse program. That At that point in time, Christy, they weren't teaching us in schools of social work um, what addiction was, or we really didn't get any training at all at, at, when I was going into school. And so they, we, get, we give them a lot now, but, but we didn't when I was in school. So I started with a person who uh, came to help me from AA, and he and I started this whole massive thing where we'd have groups for the guys, we'd bring in NA, we'd bring in AA, we'd bring in uh, staff trainings for the staff, and oh my gosh, it was a very overall and far-reaching program. And it ended up where five of the guys in the prison actually got out and went to a treatment center. But coming back to your point, I was sitting in, well, first of all, I knew I didn't know anything. So I, I begged two weeks free training at a, a center, um, an addiction center close to where we lived in Baton Rouge at the time. I'm now in the woodlands in Texas, but at that point in time, um, I was living in Baton Rouge. And so I went and got training for a few weeks in an inpatient program, all facets from assessment all the way to aftercare and everything in between. And then I came back and I started this, this program. And I had said that I would never work with alcoholics and addicts. I had a few uncles that were addic uh, addicted to alcohol and I didn't like the way it looked and I didn't like the way they treated us. So I thought, no, that's just not who I want to work with. Well, the second day on the job, when the supervisor says, you're going to run the program, I'm like, okay, God, what are you doing here? <laughs> I, knew, I knew something was going on because I just said I didn't want to do that. So again, I went and got training, I came back, and one day when I was putting on a, a, a training for the, um, all the staff, we're doing, we're viewing a movie about an alcoholic family. My parents didn't drink at all, but I knew that that was my family. I absolutely knew. My mother was addicted to prescription drugs. She has mm -hmm. now passed away, uh, bless her soul, but she... She was addicted to prescription drugs after years of migraine headaches and I think depression and just the meds they were using then were uh, <clears throat> meds that you could become addicted to. And anyway, I'm not trying to blame anybody. I'm just saying she became addicted. Right. So then I, I got into 12 step programs myself to have a, a recovery of my own. And I started the work and um, the work led me 
all the way from the prison to an outpatient program for adults. But I also added a really big family component, even with children's groups for the children of parents oh, who are addicted to alcohol or other drugs. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I went to an adolescent facility in Atlanta uh, that was more long term for dual disorders. Now we call them coexisting disorders of chemical dependency and a mental illness. And and about the time I was ending up that job, I was listening to what my the children were saying. My parents were never there, and I was realizing I'm never there. I was on a beeper. I was working such long hours. I was being called in the middle of the night. Like, it was, it was really difficult. Mm -hmm. And my oldest son had some special needs and was asking me to homeschool him. So after 10 years postmaster of all this stuff where I'm, I'm writing, I'm teaching at Georgia State and Oglethorpe, I'm going here, there and yonder around the country giving talks to, you know, to professionals. I'm actually at the end doing my own training institute for other professionals to learn it. I gave it mm -hmm. all up and I... Um, well, let me go back to learn about, in particular, addictions. I did some ethics courses and stuff, but these professionals who were licensed would come to me to learn about addictions because I knew that the schools weren't catching up yet. So uh, for the last 28 years, uh, just until June of uh, this year, 2023, I've done homeschooling with all my seven children. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I went from that to this. And then the last part of this, uh, I have, since I had to start earning my own living, I have been teaching at Lone Star and I helped uh, Belmont Abbey College develop uh, their first uh, addictions course of, they're, they're going to be doing um, um, human services bachelors. So anyway, I was working with them on that. So now I teach and I'm writing and um, just enjoying trying to help people through means, whatever means you and other people uh, have for me, I'm just trying to serve where I can. So that's kind of how I came to this. Oh, that's so great, Belinda. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is such, someday you need to write a book just on your whole story. I mean, it's so fascinating. It's, um, it's in progress too, but it's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's in a line of things right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're a woman of many, it sounds like you have a lot of like irons in the fire all the time. So that's great. That keeps you going and busy. So, so today, so most of my audience is going to be either women in recovery who are looking just to kind of clean up the mental mess, maintain sobriety, avoid relapse, or they're women who are just noticing that they're having a problem with their drinking, or maybe they're, it's not a problem yet, but it, they're noticing it might be becoming a, a bit of a problem. Okay. So I'm hoping that you can share some maybe common signs that might indicate that a woman does have a, a problem with alcohol. And I know that can look different for different people, but I'm sure there are some markers. Um, and then could you also address maybe what crossing the line into addiction would look like just so that they kind of have the scope of that. Okay, great. Yes. So when I was first beginning the way I was trained and I think that it, um, it really makes a whole lot of sense to me. So I usually describe it to people this way is that addiction is a continuum. If you're going to go, so you're going to go left to right. <laughs> I'm looking at my right, my right hand, but you're going to go left to right. And this is the time you first use, and this is death. Now, the reason it's death is because if a person becomes addicted and they keep using over time, they will die of their addiction in some way. Uh, shape or form, whether it's a liver problem with alcohol or it's a, an accident that they got into because they were high or, you know, they overdose or whatever. Like there's just so many ways to die when you're addicted. And I know that the people who are in recovery who are listening uh, understand this and probably everybody has at least someone that they know of that has mm -hmm. died from addiction. So you started the first use and at some point in time, you are drinking more than, say, one or two drinks a night, 
maybe three over the long afternoon and you're getting high, drunk or stoned, that phase then becomes where you are abusing the chemical. So you're saying, oh my gosh, well, everybody gets high or drunk. Why do you even, in this society, some people think like, well, why do you even drink if you're not going to get drunk? At At least, especially people who are in fraternities and things like that. Like, So there's a lot of pressure to drink more than what you need to drink. But the thing that starts delineating that there's a problem is when you're starting to see signs in your life areas. Um, Usually it will start with your you seeming to feel uneasy that something's not right and your family uh, making a comment I think you're starting to drink too much now I want to stop and pause for a second and tell you that there's a huge denial system with addictions Mm -hmm. where we don't who wants to be addicted nobody said well I'm just going to become an alcoholic uh, or I'm going to become an addict nobody wants to have that in their life but slowly it it happened And so there's a huge denial system around it, number one, because there's a lot of shame, which hopefully we will dispel some of that today. And the second thing is because um, they don't want to give up this primary relationship to the chemical, whether it's alcohol or another prescription drug or other drugs that they have. So if you are doing, if you are using a chemical and you start to feel uneasy sometimes about how you're using or you just don't feel like you're totally in control of yourself when you're using. You can't always stop when you say you're going to stop or your uh, husband, wife, uh, child, some your mother, someone says that they are concerned with your drinking. You have to take it seriously and you have to say, OK, I know I have a denial system, but I know I need to take this seriously because People don't want to say we have a problem when we don't. They're afraid of what it's going to make us think. And it's uncomfortable for people. So if you or someone else is saying that, then that's something you need to pay attention to. Okay, so family and marital, um, social, then you're going to go into Uh, whether you do clubs or recreational things, uh, I'm I'm thinking about your physical, like you may just not be taking care of yourself well anymore as you get get further along. You may start to have legal problems if you get a DUI or then you may have other, um, I'm trying to think, other physical problems like your doctor may be saying, you know, your liver enzymes are, are elevated or, you know, starting to look like your liver is enlarged. There's a great movie called My Name is Bill W. And Bill W. is the founder of AA and the movie, that movie and When Love is Not Enough, help you to see what this looks like as it goes along. And yes, his was a severe case. Like he he really hit a low, what I call a low bottom. He he lost everything. They even lost their home and he lost jobs. And I'll just tell you one thing is whenever I used to do um, the assessments for people, professional assessments to help, the, help understand if there was an addiction or it was just abuse still, uh, what, I would, what I would say to the person is if your job is not affected, that doesn't necessarily mean that you are not addicted because the job is usually the last thing because most people don't want to steal for the money to, to buy their their drinks or their drugs, right? They don't want to. So it's, it's not always that you can just say, well, I don't do this or I don't do that. Or, or like you said earlier, I don't look like them, but the life areas will start to all be affected and they will get worse and worse. Like now it's not just your husband saying that he thinks you drink too much, your mom or your dad or your friend, your best friend or whatever, like other people will start to say things and, and it just continues to get worse. You feel worse and worse and worse about yourself and how you've tried to do, you know, try to do this, stop this and can't stop it. And then, there's something called tolerance that helps us to know whether or not the person has crossed the line. 
And if you think about the, the feeling that you get that the chemical produces in your brain of a high and maybe maybe it was taking you three or four drinks to get that high and now you're up to five or six drinks to get that same high that's called an increase in tolerance okay and then as you keep drinking there are people maybe not everybody so i'm not saying that everybody has this but some people will say oh well it doesn't take me you know i don't even drink that much anymore i used to drink a six pack every night and now i'm drinking two beers and it's i'm fine Okay, but when you drink the two beers, do you get the same high as when you were drinking the 12? Yeah. Well, that means you have what's called a decrease in tolerance and that your body has acclimated to the chemical. So when you're understanding all this, when you get to the point where you have an increase or decrease in tolerance, okay, so we were moving along the continuum, starting to have all the problems in the life areas, keep going, keep going. Now we have an increase or decrease in tolerance. Maybe the person has had blackouts. Blackouts is usually a sign that... Um, that you've crossed over into addiction. So when you have all these things put together and you meet the criteria that's in the DSM, that's when people say the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, we're on number five now, um, but that's when people say that you uh, have a problem with uh, alcohol or other addiction. So that's kind of what it looks like to cross the line. Now, I know we were talking earlier about what, what is the continuum of care then and how do you stop before you cross the line? Well, all right, the first thing I would say about that is if you don't know if you've crossed the line or not, then stop altogether. Don't drink anymore because it's obviously, especially if you have any type, if you can look in your family, you have any type of a family history, uh, that is playing Russian roulette. That's why I stopped drinking, even though I hadn't started abusing the chemical yet, because what I learned about addiction was I can start and say, well, I'll never get high or drunk or stoned. I'll never do that. But I don't absolutely know that I won't because it's such a, it, it's such a um, factor in my family history that I'm not going to take that chance. So I would recommend that you stop maybe go to some AA meetings for, especially I recommend if you're, if you've never been to AA before, find some good women's AA meetings in the area that you're in. Because um, sometimes when people come into recovery, especially men, they're still a little on the rough side. They're, the language is rough. They're, they may not be the kind of people that you would normally hang with. And then all of that will put you off and make you think, well, I just don't want to go there. But if you're in a group with women and, um, especially if you've been abused in, in any way by a man before, it, it's a safe group and they will help you to understand whether or not this is something that you really yeah, have a problem with, or you stopped short of it or whatever. So that would be a good place to go. Now, if you've been sober, that's what we call it. If you if you've haven't drank for three months, and then you go back to drinking, or six months, and then you go back to drinking, well, you may have a problem because you can't stay stopped. Oh, well, I didn't want to stop anyway. I just wanted to stop for three months and just kind of get everything back in order. Okay, well, what I'm going to tell you is the, the likelihood is very high that it's going to go back to the same things that happened to you before, except this time it's going to go back in a faster fashion. It's like when people who are actually addicted and in recovery, when they relapse, it doesn't take as long for all the problems and everything to just start hitting them again. It, it just like, oh my gosh, I just went straight down the tube and it, it just is horrible. It's a horrible feeling and it's horrible to watch it for people because they're really trying hard to live to live their life the way they feel like they're supposed to be living their life um, within their value system and with God and with their neighbor and all that. So, so um, did you want to get into the continuum of care, like when and how to get help if you um, think you may? Yeah, have? I, yeah, I think it would be helpful for women to know like when and how they should seek professional help. Um, because if they aren't really, if they don't really think that they have a drinking problem per se, but they want to um, kind of explore that mm -hmm. or when is it like, no, I need to actually go and see, you know, not just do this on my own. Maybe, maybe they're not, 
maybe they're past the point of coaching because they have, they first have to deal with trauma and um, some other things, underlying things that are contributing to their drinking. Um, Yeah. So I guess maybe when and how should they seek professional help for any alcohol related concerns? Right. So if, if you have trauma in your past, it's a good idea to seek out an EMDR. It's EMDR therapy. And it's a specific therapy for trauma where you actually process things. And you can go from like an eight or a nine in the feeling of, of anxiety or whatever feeling brought up um, from this incident in your life or or whatever, down to a two or a three. And I'm living... Proof of that, because I've done my own trauma work, it's it's absolutely phenomenal. I couldn't be, I just couldn't be functioning the way I am right now if I had not had it. So you can go and seek help at the same time that you're going to, say, a woman's AA group so that you can kind of see what's going on and listen. Because what they share in AA is the experience, strength, and hope. And so, but they also tell some of their stories without going into. Okay. Uh, can you, you were cutting out a little a bit, little. but I think you were talking about the um, going to AA and listening to the stories as the women are sharing their experience, strength, and hope. I think that might have been the last. Yeah. Okay. So if you've tried that and you're still not able to stop drinking, then you may want to go and see a licensed chemical dependency counselor. They would be, you could Google in your area who is a LCDC. Um, They may have another credential like licensed professional counselor or LC, that's a, or they may have an LCSW, a licensed clinical social worker. But if they have LCDC, they're trained to do the assessments and they can help you. So if you start to see that you are increasing in tolerance or decreasing in tolerance, then you would need to, or you or you're having blackouts, then you need to go see somebody and get an assessment done right away. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't keep waiting because those are prompt signs and you're you you may you may end up having an emergency situation where yeah. you've overdosed or something has happened with you. So don't don't wait. Uh, If you can't stop and you think um, these symptoms or these symptoms, we call them, or or signs are there, just go and get an evaluation because what they're going to do is they're going to help you see where you are on that continuum and what you need to do. So Mm -hmm. um, the the programs, the 12-step programs can help you in in staying sober and the Uh, professionals can help you in trying to accelerate that if AA by itself is not working. Mm -hmm. So as I'm sure a lot of your recovering people in, in, you know, on the podcast can testify to, sometimes we start off by uh, maybe they have gone to treatment first and then the treatment program recommended AA or NA. And so then they go there or support, and then they're in aftercare after the program along with it. So there's this whole continuum of care, and right. maybe some of your folks have heard of how you do with mental health. You may go to a an individual therapist. You may go to group therapy. You may go then to a family or marital therapy. But in all these, that's all what we call outpatient. And then you can do something called a partial hospitalization. Uh, Those are programs that run most of the day, uh, many hours, but you go home at night. And then there's all the way to, gosh, uh, I'm having withdrawals and I need to be in a hospital for them to monitor this. um, Or my situation is so dangerous for me and the way I'm using or what I'm using that I need to be in a hospital and that's called inpatient. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you have all these different levels that when you get an assessment, they can assess where you could uh, potentially get help depending Mm -hmm. on what they're seeing and what they would recommend. And Mm -hmm. one of the things I would uh, greatly encourage people to think about is that 
If you have addiction in your family line, your partner or spouse has it in their family line, this is a high risk factor for your children. So when you stop drinking and you feel like, oh, it's the end of the world. I don't want to admit I have a problem. I don't want to admit that I, you know, that I can't drink anymore and all this stuff. I want you to remember one thing is that you are going to become now a protective factor for your children because you are going to be breaking a, a, a chain, breaking a cycle and breaking the genetic um, right. propensity for them because you're going to be in, if not recovery, recovery, because you quote had a problem, you be in recovery from just whatever depression, grief, loss, trauma, whatever else you had, you'll be in some kind of a, of a recovery program that will help you to um, get more balance in your life and help and you won't be using alcohol in the way that you used it ever again because you won't be drinking. So I, mean, I can't, I don't know how to explain it except to tell you that, you know, there's every once in a while the thought will come through my mind well, I never, ever had a problem. You know, I didn't even drink too much, you know, like, yeah. uh, do I, can't I just enjoy a glass of wine every once in a while with a meal, but I'm still not willing to go back and take the chance again, because when I made that decision, it was a good one. And so I'm sticking to it, even if I never had a problem at all and never mm -hmm. had any consequences whatsoever, because I never got drunk, you know, it's like, so, okay. I, I'm going to do what I'm doing now. And actually, for those of us who stop drinking, there's something called the Pioneer Total Abstinence Association. And that is an association for Catholics. I guess other people could join, but you're actually making reparation for those people who cannot stop drinking and are in, intemperate. And God will then give them grace. Mm -hmm. Um by your sacrifice to stop drinking. So who knows, maybe some of you are gaining the benefit of all the years I've been in this association, mm -hmm. but it's been a long time and I've been praying for you a long, long, long time. And I'm still praying for everybody who is addicted or has addiction in their family in any kind of way or mental health issues because mental health is a whole, you know, uh, it's just a whole uh, painful thing by itself. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So now having said that, uh, were there any questions that you were thinking people might have on those three, on those few things that we've been talking about before we get into the effective strategies to maintain? Yeah. Well, the only thing, other thing I wanted to mention, and we've talked about before is, um, the group Catholic in recovery. So for my Catholic audience members, which, um, I'm told is a it's like not in place of AA, but it's done in addition to AA. And it wasn't around when I did, when I was in AA. And I wish that it would have been because it would have been so wonderful to fellowship with other Catholic women and, um, or Catholics in general. And they, I know that they do have, um, I, I'll leave a link in the show notes too, but I know that they do have in-person meetings and they also have virtual meetings and they work with people with any type of disordered attachment and families. Yeah. So, and they're both good. I've gone to online uh, adult children of alcoholics meeting. I've gone to in-person uh, where both the people who are in recovery from addiction and the people who are uh, family members who have unhealthy attach attachments to those people can go to the same meeting and those mm -hmm. are excellent. So yeah, Catholic in recovery is new and it's helpful because mm -hmm. in AA, they don't want to talk about God as in Jesus or the Catholic God because it could put people off as they're coming back into recovery. Many times, uh, depending on how far, again, along that continuum you, you are, I uh, forgot to mention that one of the life areas that gets very terribly affected is your spiritual life. Mm -hmm. So I put that at the beginning in my Therapeutic Lifestyle Changes workbook that this is something you need to start working on right away. It's like as if the relationship to the chemical has become more important than the relationship to God or anybody else. And who would do that? 
on purpose. Right. So, but that's how it became because at least at the beginning, you always got a, a good high feeling out of what you were doing with the chemical, right? Out of that relationship. It was like, um, yeah, so it was positive until then it wasn't. And right. problems are here and, and I'm a mess kind of thing. So, so Catholic and recovery can help you to bridge between talking about God. Sometimes people use the phrase higher power. Um, I just wanted to say this so that people can understand. It's not that Bill W. or Dr. Bob didn't believe in God, God. They believed in God, but they didn't want to alienate anybody because even when they were drunk, they didn't want people coming at them with God because, again, they were alienated from God and everybody was preaching God at them. They would go the opposite direction as fast as they could. So, right. so they don't want yeah. anybody to come to a meeting. People start talking about Catholic faith. Well, maybe they're... Maybe their dad uh, was a was a really rageful alcoholic, and he was Catholic, and now they have all these problems with the church. And the first thing they hit AA with is Catholicism, and so they're gonna oh I'm not I don't belong here because I'm not mm-hmm. ready to give that SOB. I mean they you see what I'm saying? Yes. A lot of my clients started out. I mean they would tell me over and over and over. You know I started drinking, and I was gonna show him what it was like to drink properly, and now here I am. It's yeah. just so much grief, you know, like, Mm -hmm. because again, they didn't understand the genetic propensity and all the life factors and just what it does to witness how people cope with alcohol or whatever. That's why if you stop using, if you think you're becoming addicted, your children never see that again. And Mm -hmm. they only see you in recovery and you are going to be a protective factor. Okay. So having um, Catholic in recovery is new and also Pietra fitness. So for people who need exercise and, and intense stretching, which is a really great way to, to come, it's a really great thing to combine with meditation, but without all the Buddhist uh, elements of the yoga postures, you can do Pietra Fitness. It's, it's totally Christian. Even if you're not Catholic, I don't think you would object to Pietra Fitness. So it's like it's it's for Christians and people who are leaning toward Christian philosophy and um, and and it prevents you from being in positions of. uh, So this is not um, you and I are not talking today about why Christians shouldn't do yoga. Um, So I don't mean. Right. But if you watch the pH of fitness documentary at the beginning, you'll learn all about this. And about how even the postures have to do with the religion. So even if they're not talking religion, the, the way you're placing your hands has something to do. And, and those spirits are there. So I just want to put that out and just say pH of fitness is a way to get all that stretching in. And it's beautiful and it's safe uh, for Christians. So the other thought I had for people who are um, trying to maintain recovery and take care of themselves is the... Um, so we've covered AANA, Al-Anon, Noranon, which I haven't covered yet, Noranon, Al-Anon, Adult Children of Alcoholics, and then Alateen for Children. So if you are in recovery and you've never had your kids go to Alateen, but they were old enough to experience your drinking, they would benefit from it because just like you working the steps is helpful to you, the children work the steps in Alateen and they have a, a, a safe place to share some of the characteristics that they have started to pick up because they were perhaps taking too much responsibility in the home. That's a whole other podcast about how it right. affects children. But then we talked about EMDR, some kind of trauma therapy. And um, and that to me is the best one. And then there's a book that Dr. Burns, David Burns uh, wrote called Feeling Good, The New Mood Therapy. And I recommend it to people because it's a way to do cognitive therapy with yourself. So mm. while you're doing the trauma therapy, all these thoughts are coming up and you're seeing the thoughts and what you picked up and you can go back home and you can, uh, if you took a sheet of paper and you wrote down uh, a diagram like I'm going to, I don't know how well you'd be able to see it, but a thought leads to a feeling, leads to an action or inaction. Mm-hmm. And um, that can help you kind of set up. I don't know if you can see this here. Is it? Yeah. Okay. So if you put, I'm no good, 
that makes you feel discouraged, hopeless, and then you either freeze or you um, or you don't do what you're going to do. You don't apply for the job. Whereas if you say, I am a child of God, then you feel encouraged, hopeful. You fill out the application because you think you're worth it. Do you see? That's mm-hmm. just one little tiny example of how the negative thoughts can get to us. So that book will help. And then I wrote a book called My Therapeutic Lifestyle Changes Workbook, Creating a Comprehensive Plan for a Calm, Ordered Life. And this one is a workbook where the first three chapters, I have not written the Catholic edition yet. That's something that's in the works as soon as this other saint book finishes. But this one is out and it's totally fine because the Catholic edition will be based on this and with just some different specific examples for Catholics in a certain of the goal areas. So it's not like if you buy this one, it's a bad book or something. It's for anybody. Yeah. So the first three chapters talk about all the therapeutic lifestyle changes. And those are neuroscience based, uh, research based to help people. So I start with spirituality, because like I said, I think that spiritual enhancement is critical for people who are in any type of recovery, whether it's from uh, mental illness, addictions, being a family member of those people who have those uh, diagnoses, or, or you just had a lot of trauma in your life and whatever. Spiritual enhancement, then relationships and support group relationships come under that, your family. Uh, your social relationships. And then I have a topic called, or a TLC called service, another one called cultural identity. See, these are all the wellness areas, but usually when you think of wellness, you think of, well, food, diet and exercise. And that's where they mm-hmm. stop. No, no. When you put them all together and you make a comprehensive plan of what you want to do for your life, that's when you're going to get help. And it's been proven by research that if a person has a clinical depression and they work all these areas, I'm going to continue with the areas in just a second, but they might not have to even take an antidepressant. That's how good these things are. That's how effective. Mm -hmm. So the next one is exercise, and that can be aerobic exercise. That can be the strength training, like with pH of fitness, and that can be other type of things like dance or, um, ballet, things that that you wouldn't normally think, okay, I'm doing that for exercise, but instead of doing something that you hate where you're not going to do it, do what you love and do it. I don't care if you just put on music and dance around the house for 20 minutes. That's Mm -hmm. wonderful exercise. And if you're going to do it, then do that. As long as you do at least 20 minutes, three times a week, you're going to see some health benefits. And then for me, I exercise every day, every day that I possibly can, that I that I can do it, I'm going to do it because it releases so much stress. And a long time ago when I had a lot of stress in my life, a tremendous amount of stress, um, my doctor told me, Belinda, you have to exercise every day just to get the stress out. So that's what I do. And I do what I can. I love swimming. Swimming is very, very good. And all exercise is good for your brain as well as your body. So if you've had trauma or you have had depression or or you've used drugs, your brain has to clear of a lot of things. Your brain has to start functioning again. So exercise is not just good for your body. Because the reason I'm saying this is because I don't know if anybody listening is like me, but I couldn't make myself do exercise just for my body. I could do it when I knew my brain had been compromised because of trauma. I could then exercise because I knew that my poor, 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 tired, pitiful brain, you know, <laughs> with all this giftedness and intelligence that God has given me is just like, ugh. you know, it's just, I need something to boost that. And so I started exercising and, and it has really helped. Okay. So mm-hmm. exercise is critical. It also, it also will help you help your immune system. Um, so that, the way it's explained to me by a doctor that I had was that when you exercise for four hours after you exercise, your immune system takes a little hit. So you you think, well, then why would I exercise? Wait for the rest of it. And after that, it goes, whoo, and it's like as if you gave it a booster shot. So imagine if you every 24 hours, you're exercising in some form of fashion. I don't care as long as you do it, then your body is 
is it just takes us, it's probably going to take a smaller and smaller hit after you exercise because it'll get mm-hmm. inflammated and then it'll always be boosting your Im- immune system and it'll be continuously healing your brain. So um, then with sleep, which is the next part, a lot of times you can prevent Alzheimer's and other things by the, the way you sleep and do the rest of these TLCs. So it's not just preventing a possible addiction if you're not there yet or preventing a relapse if you are in addiction. It's also that this will give you help in the future not to become not to have Alzheimer's, or if you do, you you might have it 10 years later. So let's say I'm 70 years old and I don't get Alzheimer's until 80 and I died at 78, like I never got it. Do you see what I'm saying? So Mm -hmm. we're doing prevention here. It's a lot of prevention. Okay, so what have we covered? We've covered spiritual relationships, service, cultural identity, exercise, sleep, We've covered, now we're going to cover nutrition, and that can be food or hydration. It's extremely important for your brain to do hydration, uh, to keep keep your body hydrated. And they will tell you in the Army that you can go without food, but you cannot go without water. So that's why they wear those packs on their back everywhere they go, the hydration packs. So I talk about it in the workbook about how to keep hydrated. And then health. Okay, well, what does that mean? So I have physical and mental health. And under that, I'm covering things like under physical, especially for women. I don't know about all of y'all, but before I got into recovery, I was notorious about making all the appointments for everybody in my family except for myself. Um, I cannot tell you how much prevention is done just by getting a yearly physical and a yearly gynecological exam with a mammogram. Mm And if we're not taking care of ourselves and committing to ourselves that we are worth and our children are worth having us there for the long term, um, then we're going to let that slide. So I'm not talking here about physical, like with exercise and nutrition. We've already covered those areas. I'm talking about physical, like making yearly exams, making dental exams, making all these other exams that have to do with your physical body and doing those things. And then under mental and emotional health, I'm talking about scheduling appointments to see what a nutritionist, eating disorder specialist, if you think you might be coming up with that, a trauma specialist, um, doing journaling. Um, I'm, I'm talking about a lot of different things that you can do under your mental health, reading the the cognitive therapy things and trying to do the thought replacement where you're thinking more positive thoughts. So that's all the health, physical, mental. And then we have work finances. Look at all the different areas that most people don't ever like put all together and make a plan about. We just do a few of them, right? Mm -hmm. Work finances and people who are in recovery sometimes have a lot of problems in this area. So you have to make a plan of how you're going to get the finances back in order. And then I talk about brain work, whether it's neurobics, where you're doing crossword puzzles or chess or Sudoku or whatever. And I talk about higher education because that in itself is just a, a, a way to work your brain. But if you if you don't do anything else, a very quick tip is next to your rocking chair or your couch or your lounger or whatever you do when you're watching movies at home, just put a little book of crossword puzzles or word finds or whatever and and just do that or coloring book because that that rhythmic uh, motion of the coloring book is very good for your brain too and that can come under creativity as well in the next area but for right now you can just sit and do brain work while you're watching a movie uh i do word finds all the time so mm-hmm. then the next area is creativity and i go into all the different things because a lot of people think well i'm not good at drawing or i'm not good at uh, play. I don't play an instrument. Oh, well, that doesn't mean you're not creative. You're totally, everybody's creative. It's just in what way you are that you have to discover. And so right. talk about maybe you love um, doing things with your house and, and making things uh, look better. You might like painting your house or decorating your home, or you may like doing hair. Maybe you 
cut people's hair or braid people's hair. That's all artistic. And you just never thought about it in that way. So if we can get creativity in, well, you're thinking to yourself, oh, I'm overwhelmed just listening to you. Yes, yes. <laughs> you, can, you can feel that way if you haven't planned anything in any of, any of your areas. So we start with the top one. What is the one thing in your life that if you put right, all the other areas would get better? And I haven't mentioned the last one, and that's the self-discipline, the screen time, the alcohol and the drugs, the smoking, the any other addictions that you may have, especially if it's something that, that rewires your brain, like pornography, like all those things. What's the one area out of all these things that if I put right, everything would get better? In my classes, when I do this, because this workbook I, I developed for my students, that's, that's how I developed this workbook. I would give them the fourth chapter, which is where you actually, uh, I'll show you here, actually start writing your physical, your I mean, your spiritual area, and then you go from one to the next as you go through the chapter, if you can see it. Um, I would give them a modified version of that. and. Excuse me, I think I hit something and turned off my video. Okay. Here you are. <laughs> Modified version of that. And then I'd tell them what to do. And then by the time they got home to their computer, they were like, well, now what did professor say about that? And they couldn't yeah. remember. Well, I'm, a, I'm an author. Why don't I just write it? And so that's how the first three chapters. Then when they got, they read the chapters and they got to chapter four, they could turn to chapter three with the most, um, the most specific so in chapter three, like in exercise, I give you an example of a first try. Would it be like for someone who says, well, I used to walk three works, three days a week, and I want to start walking again and add trampoline work. Well, something better than that was I'll walk up and down stairs at school and in my apartment two days a week and work out on my trampoline three days a week. Well, now the best, so you see I'm doing first try better best. The best would be I will resume exercise. I'll get in 20 minutes of exercise on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday from 4 p.m. by rotating, jumping on the trampoline Monday and Friday, walking up and down stairs, Wednesday and Saturday. Look how specific I'm getting. And I'm mm -hmm. showing you how to get specific because what happens is um, whether it's you or my students, uh, they come to me and they say, and they say what normally you'd have in first try or better. And then I'm like, no, 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 I need to know when you're committing to yourself. To put that in because right now you don't have it you don't have a place in your schedule so mm -hmm. when you're trying to put in your tlc's you've got your calendar you've got your understanding of what your life is like you've got the areas that you need to put back into place in the most uh like immediate fashion and you got and you're kind of going from there and mm -hmm. so you start with that area no matter where that is in the thing if it's sleep like most of my students are sleep deprived so they start with their sleep and the next week when we come back to class well how's your sleep oh my gosh i'm so much better everything is so much better mm -hmm. it's like, yeah it's amazing when you focus on it how and you like devote time to it how all of a sudden it can change and because if you're trying to do it all at one time then it seems so overwhelming because you want it, at least my brain is like, I need to do all the things at once. But if I slow down and I'm like, no, I'm just going to focus on sleep. And then that gets better. I'm just going to focus on nutrition next. And, and that gets better. Finish sleep. And now what's the next area that if you put yeah. that right, it'll be better. And you put that one in. So, and exactly. there'll be some things that you already have. Like, let's say, a person um, who's listening is in AA already, and they go to, let's say, two AA meetings a week, or maybe they go to three. Um, everybody differs and varies depending on the length of time they've been in recovery, et cetera. But maybe you're going to do, you're going to say, okay, I will go to these two AA meetings a week, and I'll add in a CI, a Catholic in recovery, CI or a Catholic in recovery meeting uh, online during the week. Or if, you, if you're fortunate enough to have one in your uh, area, then you could go to it because uh, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed the one that I'm going to. So, um, yeah. And so you can add that in and restructure just a bit while still maintaining your continuity of what you already have in place. Okay. So mm -hmm. let's say you, you haven't done any stretching, but you're hearing about how it's really going to help you and it's going to help you 
and flow into your meditation if you do pH or fitness. Okay, so now I'm going to walk three times a week and do pH or fitness on Saturday afternoon or, or Sunday evening, whatever. Like, mm-hmm. I really love it on Sunday night to try to get in a, a hot bath once a week and I like to treat myself on Sunday I do a lot of um like while I'm watching movies with my family or whatever I might be doing my nails or you know a lot of the (laughs) self-care isn't just like pampering kind of thing self-care is really all this stuff we're talking about where these areas of your life are getting more balanced but that doesn't mean that you have to throw out any pampering things or things that you would normally do grooming or whatever. It's just that you, you have them in a, a, in a, in your system and they're kind of planned. And if you already are doing them and it's working, then maybe while you're doing your nails, you're meditating on something, or let me give you an example. And I put it in the workbook that one of my students was getting her, um, She would drink coffee in the morning while she listened to a a book of literature. She loved reading books and she liked the audio books the best. So she put that on and she drank her coffee and she just loved it. Well, those two, the literature and uh, the, the literature was in there. And every once in a while she would get exercise in. She wasn't walking the dog as much as she was supposed to. And she wasn't exercising as much as she was supposed to. So I asked her, I said, and she wanted to meditate, but she never could do it. So I said, well, how about this? Would you consider just swapping things? You've already got something in place. When you sit down in the morning with your cup of coffee, or I don't drink coffee normally. Let me just tell you that the caffeine robs your bones of calcium. (laughs) 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 Nursing years are bad. Oh, you're a downer, Belinda. just don't do caffeine very much I'm teasing (laughs) but um, anyway so I I drink tea but I said what if when you're drinking your coffee in the morning you would do you would read your bible and do your meditation so she wasn't catholic but she was one of my students who was christian and actually most of them are anyway but she said yeah that would work but what would I do about my I said well you could put your books on your head while you're walking the dog and that'd be exercise your books and the dog. Yeah. So oh, sometimes you can get in all your TLCs by combining them with something else if mm-hmm. you just get creative. So even working out your TLCs is a very creative thing. But this is part of how you can either work on stopping drinking and building your life back before you cross the line. Or if you are, if you do consider yourself as a person who's already in recovery, And um, you want to continue to maintain your recovery and you want to just have the best life possible. These TLCs will help get your brain back and help get your body back into the shape that you want uh, Mm -hmm. in a very, um, I want to say, balanced way, you know, in a Mm -hmm. very balanced way. So, yeah, so we've got some resources with the TLCs, with the Pietra Fitness, the Catholic and Recovery, the EMDR all the 12 step groups, depending on which one, where you fall. And then books, there's all kind of books that I could recommend. I just happened to mention one feeling good, but in the back of the, um, uh, in the back of the book, uh, there's a whole section. It's called the bibliography and extra reading, and it goes for pages. So, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> thing you're working on like sleep. I did, I looked up a researcher when I was, researching that part and she says that between 10 30 and 12 are our optimal times for our brain to recover I don't I, I'm not saying that it's not like I want everybody to go to bed at 10 30 because I just feel like I want to control things she said <laughs> so I'm still one of you all uh, along with everybody else who is trying to get my sleep habits incorrectly and trying to help my brain and uh, you know if I when you're on central uh, I mean, daylight savings time and you switch, it's difficult to understand where you are. Where's 1030? But I'm going to try mm-hmm. to do what I can eventually uh, to put that in order. So it's just things like this. I give you resources in the back of the book where you can go and find uh, these things. And and the, the website you mentioned at the beginning, T- but it's TLC Wellness Institute, TLC Wellness Institute.com. And I'll have that in the show notes. Yeah. And then you, or you could just go straight to Amazon and put in my name and all my books will come up and that'll be one of you. Okay. So Mm -hmm. either way. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. Yeah, those are some really great resources because I know a lot of the work that I do with my clients, we do work on like the think, feel, act cycle. And then, um, and actually I got your workbook after I had spoken with you and I really like it. It's an excellent resource for anyone who wants to do some self-coaching because it is, um, it does touch on all those aspects of our lives and you know, balance is a huge thing that comes up for all of my clients, whether they're in recovery or just looking to drink less or not at all. It's it's about balance. It's about stress management. It's about finding healthier ways to cope. And um, I love all the um, information and resources that you gave. But again, your workbook, it just, it does. It just covers all of those things because we have to have, um, you know, We don't have to do it all at once, like we talked about earlier, but just piecing it out and figuring out what is the priority and addressing that. And I also love, because this is what I work on with my clients is like getting very specific. And I think that's what your good, better, best does. Cause it's like, oh, I'm going to, sometimes I'll say, okay, well, what are you going to do about that? And they're like, oh, I'll journal. I'm like, that's great. When can we do that? Like, when would be a great time to do that? And then they'll be like, you know, I, I have like time in the morning after I take the kids to school. I'm like, great. Like, what room do you want to be in when you do that? You know, what feelings do you want to have as you're anticipating doing it? You know, so we walk through all of that and, um, and they can do that with your workbook. So I just think that that's so beautiful. And, um, I appreciate all of this information because I know it is going to be so, so helpful. Honestly, that TLC workbook is great for anybody, even if you're not struggling with addiction. Like we all have such busy lives or we think that we do. And when we actually can like really focus on each thing and just kind of balance it, it's amazing the amount of time that we find and it's like, oh yeah. (laughs) And we don't feel so hurried and stuff. Right. And I love what you just said, because like with my students, one of my students, I I talked to them about the Pomodoro method where you do 25 minutes of whatever that is and five minutes doing something else. And I said, what I do is I sit at my computer and I either grade y'all's papers or stuff, or I'm writing because most of what I do is writing. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm an adjunct professor and so my classes are like in addition to my my writing so um, I'll sit down for 25 minutes and then I'll go put on a load of clothes and then I'll come back for you know for five then I come back another 25 minutes and then I go load the dishwasher and one of my students uh, came and at the beginning of the semester she was struggling so terribly with her um, her laundry she could never keep up because she had most of my students at the community college that I teach are working they have families and they're coming to school so they some of them are working very uh, they're working full-time jobs they just wanted to come back to get their LCDC or uh, start toward their bachelor's at a at a uh, you know, at a place that's less expensive or whatever. Okay, so she had all this stuff going on and she started doing this and she put that as part of her goals. I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to structure my study time to where I can do the Pomodoro method and I'm going to work that with my laundry. And at the end of the semester, she was all smiles like, oh, this is amazing. I don't have a problem with laundry anymore. So, you know, I just just wanted you all of you to know that it's not um in the program we talk about doing the next right thing it's not like this is all gonna okay I've got to sit down and then if I don't do all this I'm gonna start beating myself up no you do the first thing that needs to be changed then you do the next one and then the next one and eventually every life area and all the wellness areas are wonderful and yes what you were saying was so true I started writing the book for my for my class uh, my students not to get burned out because that's what I had done. And I realized as I was writing it, oh, God is calling me to help a lot more people than just these folks. Because mm-hmm. anybody who cares about wellness in any way can use the TLC workbook. And mm-hmm. as you know, as far as I know, there's absolutely nothing else like it. And nobody's even doing most of these areas, even if they're writing about them and not putting away right. from you. Um, so the mm-hmm. the most I could find was the University of Kansas that did the, I think it was exercise, nutrition, and one other thing. And I can't 
number right now. Like it was only three. Yes. Yeah. I know that this is going to help a lot of people. And I try to give it for Christmas gifts myself because yeah. <laughs> you find to do their TLCs. Um, yes. People yeah, it's a blessing. With a lot of loss or grief, but they have family yeah. members who have lost a loved one by helping them to, to formulate their TLCs. That person can, you know, even if they don't feel like doing it, they can do something to take care of themselves. It's It mm-hmm. goes beyond the feeling to uh, know I've committed to myself that I will take care of myself. And this is what I'm doing today. I'm going to do the next right thing. Yeah. I love that. I love that so much. Thank you so much for being here, Belinda. I know that I'm going to have you back because every time I talk to you, I just get like more ideas. And so I am so grateful. We connected on Instagram of all places and Belinda reached out to me and we chatted and um, yeah, I, I'm just so grateful. God is so good, right? He just kind of puts people in our paths um, at the right time. So you've been a blessing to me. I know you've been a blessing to everybody else. So thank you for being here. Connect with me. Y'all can, I think the easiest way would be Instagram, which uh, yeah. Chris will have in the thing. And then my, the www.tlcwellnessinstitute.com is where you can see my books and maybe get on my email list if you want to. So um, just keep in contact. If you have questions, you know, um, I'm here. Um, but I hope that you will uh, work your TLCs. You will get into whatever recovery program that is for you. And uh, again, if if you cannot, if you're trying to reduce your drinking and you cannot not get drunk, that's a bad sign. That's a warning sign that you need to get help. You go to AA go get a, an evaluation and get some help because you don't want your children to live through with you what you're going to be living through. You want the children to live through a good life with you. Yes. Yeah. That is so important. Thank you so much, Belinda. And I will look forward to speaking with you again soon. Okay. God, right. bless. God bless you. Bye. Well, that does it for this episode of the Catholic Sobriety Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I would invite you to share it with a friend who might also get value from it as well. And make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a thing. I am the Catholic Sobriety Coach, and if you would like to learn how to work with me or learn more about the coaching that I offer, visit my website, the Catholic Sobriety Coach. Com. Follow me on Instagram at the Catholic Sobriety Coach. I look forward to speaking to you next time. And remember, I am here for you. I am praying for you. You are not alone.